led by Institut Min Telecom uh, Business School and uh, Sciences Po, in partnership with two engineering schools belonging to Institut Min Telecom, uh, Telecom Paris and Telecom Sud Paris. We are also in partnership with the Risk Foundation of Institut Louis Bachelier. So in Good in Tech, we have interdisciplinary teams working on uh, four main topics. The first one is responsible digital innovation, how to model that, how to measure it and uh, put it in corporate social responsibility. We have a second topic on uh, technologies responsible by design, which is the topic of today. Uh, we work here on ethics of uh, artificial intelligence mainly. The third uh, topic on which we work is how to think the future. And the last one is governance of uh, responsible uh, technologies. So if you want uh, uh, to have additional details on, on uh, what we do or partnerships, you can uh, look at uh, our website. So today I'm very pleased to welcome our three famous speakers. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Stefan uh, Clemenson to be here. So Stefan uh, is a full professor in applied mathematics and machine learning at uh, Telecom Paris. And Stefan uh, will make a presentation on bias and fairness issues in machine learning. I would like to uh, sincerely thank uh, Julia uh, Stojanovic to be here. Uh, Julia uh, works in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Tandem School of Engineering at uh, New York University, and she's also a member of the Center for Data Science. And Julia is going to make a presentation on uh, responsible data science. Our third uh, speaker is uh, Serge Abitboul. Serge is Director of Research in Computer Science at École Normale Supérieure de Paris and at INRIA and he is also a member of the ARCEP uh, College. Uh, so in this session we will have two parts. Uh, the first part uh, will be the three presentations of our speakers. They have uh, 15 minutes uh, to present and we will have five minutes for Q&A after each presentation. And in the second part of the webinar we will have a panel of our three speakers uh, they will debate on data bias challenges and we will answer also to other Q&A. Uh, so for the participants, I ask you to um, uh, mute your microphone and videos and you can put your question in the discussion area and we will take your question in the, in the Q&A part. So let's begin with the uh, presentation. So uh, uh, Stéphane Clemenson, uh, the floor uh, is yours. So Jean-Marie is going to, to share the presentation. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to give a short overview of a few contributions to bias and fairness uh, issues in AI uh, recently made with the, with the help of some of my colleagues. Uh, of course, there are many ways of uh, approaching these topics. My perspective is that of mathematics, of statistical learning, or machine learning, if you prefer. This is the, the branch of AI, say, dedicated to the design, to the practice, and to the analysis of uh, database approaches. It's for predictive tasks uh, mainly, but uh, not only. Maybe, uh, jean marie you can switch to the next one. So the idea behind this uh, algorithm is to avoid um, rigid assumptions on the data generating process. The form of a predictive rule is uh, not specified in advance. It is learned from uh, examples, from training data shown to the machine. And the question addressed are of various nature. Uh, you are interested in uh, uh, finding the optimal predictive rules, uh, in investigating their capacity to generalize well. Of course, it's easy to predict the past, but uh, will, uh, will it predict uh, well the future data? Uh, also computational and algorithmic uh, aspects, and now many issues concerning the applicability of these uh, methods, robustness, uh, reliability, and also ethical character, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, maybe next slide, uh, Jean-Marie. So uh, this corpus of methods uh, has led to very successful applications, uh, speech recognition, computer vision, 
and also biometrics now with the development of uh, facial recognition systems, for instance. And uh, thanks. Uh, many of these solutions, they have export IDs elaborated for the pattern recognition problem. So if you formulate this in the computer vision context, the goal is to compute a rule that automatically detects whether a certain object is present in a pixelized image or not, and with a probability of error that is minimum. Of course, this probability of error is unknown. We do not know all the images susceptible to be shown in the, to the computer vision system. And in practice, the, the learning algorithm consists of an optimization program. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this optimization program seeks to minimize the, the frequency of errors over a set of training examples. This is the empirical version of the risk. And this is the main paradigm of machine learning. It is referred to as uh, empirical risk minimization, because of course you agree with the fact that it's always easy to predict uh, the past, but the success of the learning approach is supported by some probabilistic theory. It, I won't go in, into detail, but uh, roughly this theory says that if a rule you try to learn is not too complex, and if the distribution of the training data is exactly the same as that of future data, data to which the predictive system will be applied, uh, then the rule learned by means of empirical risk minimization has the capacity to generalize well to new data, unseen yet. And uh, next slide, please. This is uh, described mathematically by, uh, by bounds, probabilistic bounds, saying that the, the risk of error of the rule learned using a finite number of training examples is nearly the same as that attained if all possible data had been presented to the machine, up to uh, a rate of order square root of n. And this is true whatever the distribution of the data. It's a universal result of minimax nature, statistician would say, and it really works, empirical risk minimization. The, the theory is, is right, and now we live in the, in the big data era. We have lots of data to train machines, and a lot of computing power to solve the optimization problems. Uh, thank you. Uh, however, in practice, training data are often those that are easily available, on the web in particular, uh, compared to the era of information collection through questionnaires and uh, surveys with experimental designs uh, really carefully elaborated. Um, now the, the data acquisition process is uh, very poorly controlled and certain segments of the target population can be really uh, underrepresented. Uh, and uh, in particular, consider the, the case of uh, uh, facial recognition systems. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very uh, popular now. Some of them are accused of being racist because they are much less accurate for certain groups of people. Of course, this is uh, really pure nonsense. The learning algorithm has no intention regarding uh, ethnicity. However, oh, uh, however, on the, on the NIST platform of the US governance, you can check that uh, many systems uh, perform better for certain segments of the population and, uh, and worse for, for others. You can plot the, say, the, the rock curves, uh, the false positive rate against the, uh, the true uh, positive rate. And you see that more mistakes are made when uh, identifying black faces, for instance. Uh, and indeed, uh, among images on the web, uh, Caucasian people are overrepresented. So a crucial question is what can we do and what can be said when the training data are not distributed as those on which the system will be applied to? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, I, I, the, the next slide. This is not really useful. Uh, recently, the, the machine learning community has focused on the situation where the, the input data, the images, say in a computer vision problem, have not the same format as those uh, easily available, and the goal uh, is to find a common representation uh, by means generally of internal layers of a deep neural network so as to transfer what has been learned for images with a certain format, say uh, RGB uh, images, to images of another kind, in infrared, for instance. Uh, 
uh, it's, uh, it's a specific uh, transfer learning problem, but here we are considering a more general uh, problem. Ne next slide, please. So, uh, thank you. Uh, here, uh, the training uh, data disposal are uh, distributed from a uh, uh, source distribution that is different from the, um, the distribution of the target population. So the, the idea, uh, how, how to take into account this, the idea is very simple. Uh, the idea is to weight the training data so that the distribution, the weighted distribution of your data looks like the target distribution. Next slide, please. And uh, of course, if, if this way you can reproduce the, um, the, the true risk and you can control the, the fluctuations, then uh, you can have a guarantee. It's not easy because you need an algorithm to compute the weights. Uh, and then it's a very lengthy exercise to, uh, to elaborate a theory saying that it works. And uh, just to tease the, the uh, the SQL, uh, there is no free lunch. You need some extra information about the target population. Uh, mathematics they can be very sophisticated, but they don't create uh, information. You know, you have to know something about uh, the biasing mechanism. Next slide, please. So uh, suppose, for instance, that uh, you have collected your uh, training ex examples uh, by means of uh, survey technique. Then, if you know, uh, if you have conducted the, the survey, you know the inclusion probability, the probability that a certain uh, observation is included in your uh, sample. Uh, and you can use these, the inverse of these inclusion probabilities to weight your sample. It's a very old um, uh, principle called uh, Orvitz Thompson in, uh, in survey theory. And uh, you can uh, replace uh, your risk by the orbit thompson estimation. Of course, in general, it's a, it's a biased estimate of the risk, but it works. If you know uh, the inclusion probability, uh, it works. It's not that easy. Next slide, please, to, to, uh, to show that it works, because in general, um, uh, the, 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 the survey sample uh, exhibits a very strong dependence structure, uh, but uh, in many, in many situations, for many uh, survey techniques, you can show that uh, uh, you can still apply uh, empirical risk minimization with guarantees. Next slide, please. OK, uh, so uh, I, uh, I won't go into details, but we have plenty of results saying that uh, if you know the acquisition process, uh, and even, of course, if your survey sample is not uh, representative of your uh, of your target population, you can uh, correct uh, the selection bias. Next slide, please. Next, uh, again, I won't have time to, to discuss that. Uh, but in, uh, in practice, in, uh, you don't know the inclusion probabilities. Uh, you, you exploit the data that are easy to, uh, to, to collect. For instance, uh, if you want to predict the time to uh, full recovery for people attended by COVID-19, for instance, depending uh, I don't know, on physiological features, you would probably experience a strong right censorship with your training data. And in that case, the inclusion probability for an unbiased observation is the probability of not being censored. Okay. Consequently, next slide, please. Consequently, in, in, in this case, uh, you have to estimate the probability of not being censored and plug it into the risk functional. The weight uh, depends on the data as well. And what you can show is that uh, if you know that the, the, biasing, uh, the biasing mechanism is, uh, is uh, a censorship, you can show that you do not deteriorate the machine learning uh, procedure. You get the same uh, rates of convergence, the same accuracy, the same capacity to generalize well uh, than if uh, you had uh, non-biased data. Um, thank you. Next, next uh, slide. Uh, it, it works. I mean, uh, we have uh, conducted a lot of uh, experiments. Now it's included in some uh, packages, uh, scikit-learn, for instance. Uh, we can. Um, we can take into account certain types of uh, biasing uh, mechanism. But there is no universal way of computing the, the weights. It really depends on the nature of uh, the available information about the, the mechanism. 
And the, the remedy for bias problems is uh, much more general than this inverse probability weighting. The weights should not be necessarily inverse of probabilities, and uh, it can be rephrased in terms of important sampling, if you're familiar with, uh, with this kind of uh, techniques. Uh, ne next uh, slide, please. Okay. Uh, just finally, to tell the truth, uh, debiasing can be insufficient to overcome the, the great disparity in terms of accuracy observed in facial recognition. Certain problems are intrinsically more difficult than others. Think about the identification of newborns. Uh, the accuracy is, of course, conditioned by the technology, uh, the class of rules over which learning is performed, uh, the deep neural networks uh, architecture, for instance. Uh, they have their own uh, limitations, and some of them are more appropriate for certain problems than for others. But you, you, you have the intrinsic difficulty of, uh, of some uh, predictive problems. And uh, if you want to equalize accuracy over specific sensitive subgroups, that is to say to, to achieve a certain form of fairness, you should add constraints in the learning program in order to force the system to be equally accurate. Next uh, slide, please. And there are various formulations of fairness. Uh, I won't have time to go into details, especially for local learning problems, for classification, uh, pattern recognition. Uh, it's now receiving a, a lot of attention in the, in the community. Uh, but the difficulty for many applications, such as uh, face identification, is that you, you compute a score to take your decision uh, and a wide range of false positive rates uh, can be uh, stipulated to evaluate the performance of your score. And the, the constraints can be, uh, can be quite uh, tricky. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Jean-Marie. Thank you. Uh, next slide again. I was uh, running out of time. Um, but just uh, to, uh, to tell the conclusion, you can incorporate constraints so that you equalize the, the, the performance of the all sensitive subgroups, I don't know, maybe uh, ethnical uh, subgroups or uh, gender, I, I don't know, sensitive uh, variable. But what could happen is that uh, you, could deteriorate, you could deteriorate much uh, the performance. And really, it depends on the use case uh, at end. Uh, but what I, we have shown, uh, for instance, uh, for facial recognition or for other problem credit scoring, for instance, is that you can achieve some, sometimes a very satisfactory trade-off between uh, fairness and uh, performance. Uh, of course, there is no uh, there is no universal theory saying that uh, this is always possible, and it's very difficult to describe conditions under which it is feasible. But uh, this approach uh, works uh, to guarantee some fairness. But of course, you, you need a, a definition of fairness that can be uh, encoded uh, by uh, uh, numerical uh, constraints. Uh, that's it. That's all I have. Uh, I can I can tell you in in 15 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, I don't know if participants uh, have uh, some uh, question. I don't see the question for the moment in the discussion part. Uh, so uh, we have a question from uh, Charles Turat. Um, so um, Charles, do you want to ask the question directly to Stefan? Yes, of course. Just let me unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So thank you very much for this session. First of all, uh, I had a question on the example of facial recognition models uh, who have a problem with uh, recognizing uh, uh, accurately some specific uh, groups of people, uh, depending on, et on ethnicity or age, for example. And I was wondering, as I'm not a specialist in uh, deep learning or facial recognition or computer vision, I was wondering if it's possible to train models specifically to recognize this, let's say, problematic in terms of fairness groups and have these specific models work uh, in tandem with more general models 
uh, to uh, better predict uh, the recognition when the general model uh, can't reach a sufficient threshold for prediction accuracy. I'm not sure if I'm clear in my question. You mean that uh, you could consider um, running or implementing a specific uh, facial recognition system for a specific uh, segment, that's it? Let, yes, for example, for with your example about babies, we, would it be relevant to train a model to detect specifically uh, babies, not just detect, but identify babies? And so when a general model trained on, let's say, adults, uh, can't uh, process a picture of a, uh, of someone because mm, they don't reach a, a confidence threshold high enough. Uh, we run in a second time uh, a, a baby facial recognition model to sure. check if the problem is because the people that we want to identify is too young for the general model, for example. In general, uh, from a practical uh, uh, angle you have one software and uh, but of course the neural network some part of the neural network uh, are used for specific uh, segments that's how it works in practice yeah but uh, the, you train it by uh, optimizing uh, the error globally uh, and okay. in general you cannot necessarily use uh, some uh, some feature for instance uh, ethnicity it's not possible to to use this as a feature uh, variable in your uh, solution. Okay. Just have to use the image, so it's it's not. Uh, it is connected as well to, to legal aspects. I'm not a, I'm not a specialist of that, but I know that uh, we have to work on images and not on uh, uh, extra uh, features. I work a lot with uh, the Idemia company, for instance, but. Uh, Again, I'm not a specialist of uh, the deployment of, uh, of this. Solution. Okay, so the, if I understand correctly, the best idea is to still train one model, but with uh, data sets that are diverse enough uh, to uh, take into account all uh, uh, all variation, all possibilities. Sure. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Stefan. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for your presentation. We don't have any other question for the moment. So uh, we uh, now have a presentation of uh, Julia on uh, responsible data science. So uh, Julia, the flow is yours. And Jamari, you can uh, upload the presentation, please. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction. And sorry to be making everybody speak French, uh, because I believe that I'm the only uh, person who doesn't speak French on this call. It's not a problem. <laughs> I have to correct that <laughs> at some point. OK, so um, it is my pleasure to be speaking to all of you here today. Uh, my name is Julia Stojanovic. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of computer science and engineering and of data science at New York University. And I also direct the newly established Center for Responsible AI at NYU, New York University. And today it is my pleasure to speak with you on a topic that I'm very passionate about, and that's a topic where my mind and my heart meet, and that is the responsible use of data science and AI. To motivate this work and this exposition, I would like for us to start with an example, and that example is automated hiring systems. Since the 1990s and increasingly so in the last decade, commercial tools are being used by companies large and small to hire more efficiently, source and screen candidates faster and with less paperwork, and successfully select candidates who perform well on the job. The hiring process has been aptly described as a funnel that is depicted here. It's a sequence of data-driven algorithm-assisted steps in which a series of decisions culminates in job offers to some candidates and rejections to others. These tools are meant to improve efficiency both for candidates and uh, for the... Oh, so, yeah, I'll tell you when to move. These tools are meant to improve efficiency both for employers and for the job applicants matching them with relevant positions and allowing them to apply with a click of a button. 
and facilitating the interview process. Next slide, please. Next. Thank you. One of the earliest indications that there is cause for concern, no, previous, came in 2015 with the results of the Ad Fisher study out of Carnegie Mellon University in the US. The authors ran an experiment and found that ads for high paying jobs were shown significantly more frequently to men than to women, all else being equal. In late 2018, there was another report, this time about Amazon's AI recruiting tool that was developed with the stated goals of improving workforce diversity, but it did the opposite thing. The tool learned to discriminate against women based on resumes. It uh, would downgrade resumes that included the word women's, as in women's chess club captain, and it downgraded uh, graduates of two all-women's colleges in the U.S. Other examples include discrimination against individuals suffering from mental illness, such as depression and bipolar disorder, on the basis of online personality tests, even if they have the right skills for the job. And another example is when uh, potential employers, when they're doing background checks of employees, are being shown ads that are suggestive of a criminal record when they Google for African-American sounding names. These are names that are more frequently given to African-American babies in the US than when Googling for white sounding names. And this happens even if you control for whether an individual in fact has a criminal record. To summarize, we are concerned about the use of data-driven algorithmic systems in a variety of domains of which hiring is a strong example. Their effects, the effects of these systems are often discriminatory, reinforcing results of historical disadvantage. This discrimination is often linked to the term bias, and it's a term that is used by the technical community ever more frequently, but that remains poorly understood. Next slide, please. To discuss bias, I would like to recall uh, a paper from 1996 that was written by Helen, uh, by Batya Friedman and Helen Nissenbaum, and that identifies three types of bias that can arise in computer systems. These types of bias I'm representing here with the help of a three-headed dragon that has three heads, pre-existing, technical, and emergent. Pre-existing bias exists independently of an algorithm itself, and it has its origins in society. Technical bias is introduced by the operation of the technical system, and it may exacerbate pre-existing bias. Finally, emergent bias arises in a context of use of a system, and it may be present if the system was designed with different users in mind, or when societal concepts shift over time. Next slide, please. We will fight the dragon, uh, the, the bias dragon, with uh, the help of data equity. Equity as a social concept, treating people differently depending on their endowments and needs uh, to provide equality of outcome rather than equality of treatment, lends a useful unifying vision for ongoing work to operationalize ethical concerns across technology, law, and society and I'm going to work with that vision. Data equity has three major facets. Representation equity refers to deviations between the data record and the world that this data is meant to represent, often with respect to historically disadvantaged groups. Access equity, the second sword of my equity knight, is concerned with having access to information in the form of features, data, and models that are needed to evaluate and mitigate inequity. Finally, outcome equity refers to downstream unanticipated, unanticipated consequences that are outside the direct control of the system. I will now go through each of these data equity types very quickly to give the flavor of some of this positioning and how it plays out in technical systems. And as will become clear, Purely technical solutions are never sufficient. They have to be based on explicitly stated values and beliefs that in turn must arise through public conversation and social consensus. 
So next slide, please. Let's start with representation equity. Next. Representation equity, once again, is about whether data faithfully reflects the world. And the way that I like to think about this is that data is an image of the world. It's mirror reflection. When we think about societal bias in the data, we interrogate this reflection. Next slide. One interpretation of bias in the data is that this reflection is distorted. We may systematically oversample or undersample particular parts of the world or otherwise distort the readings. Another interpretation of bias on the data is that even if we were able to take a perfect picture of the world and reflect that in the data, it would still be a reflection of the world such as it is today and not necessarily of how it could or should be. It's important to keep in mind that a reflection cannot know whether it's distorted. That is, data alone cannot tell us whether it's dis a distorted reflection of a perfect world, a perfect reflection of a distorted world, or if these distortions compound. And further, it's not up to data or algorithms, but other up, rather up to people, individuals, groups, and society at large, to come to consensus about whether the world is how it should be or if it needs to be improved, and if so, how we should go about improving it. Next slide, please. My final point here is that changing the reflection does not necessarily change the world. If the reflection itself is used to make important decisions, for example, whom to hire or what salary to offer to an individual being hired, then compensating for the distortions is worthwhile. And we do that, for example, by debiasing data or collecting more data. But the mirror metaphor only takes us so far. We have to work much harder, usually going far beyond technical solutions, such as debiasing of data or algorithms, to propagate the changes back into the world, not merely brush up the reflection. Next slide, please. Access equity, and next again. Access equity is concerned with having access to information that is features, data, and models needed to evaluate and mitigate inequity. The point I will make here is that it's important, it's worthwhile to be looking at technical bias, at making sure that we're able to catch and correct the imperfections and distortions in the data as it travels through complex data science pipelines. Next slide. Much exciting work remains in supporting access equity, both in terms of practical implementations and in forming a conceptual understanding of the interactions between pre-existing and technical bias and how these then impact equity and society. The FAIR machine learning research community considers this work to be out of scope. Their focus is on predictive analytics that take as input a nice rectangular data set, crunch it, and produce a result. If we then notice that the result is such that no women are shown ads for high paying jobs or that no black candidates are invited for job interviews, then we have three choices. We can tweak the input data, for example, upsample or downsample some group or debias in some other way. We can tweak the algorithm, for example, add a regularization term, or we can tweak the result, for example, by reassigning some of the outcomes. And this is a useful exercise, but it's a limited view. And I'm showing this view here as fighting a paper dragon. We need to expand our scope and start asking what specifically happens inside the algorithmic box, how results are used, and importantly, where the data came from. Next slide. In other words, taking a life cycle view of equity is required. And this is something that is underappreciated in the technical community. Next. I will zip through this very quickly here, but here's an example of some of the concerns that might arise for us data scientists as we engage in our day-to-day -day tasks. Consider Anne, a data scientist in human resources department at a large retailer. She was tasked with developing a model that predicts the level of compensation to offer to successful job applicants. To make sure that they are in fact hired successfully and that they are treated fairly by uh, the process. 
and is going to use candidates' self-reported demographics together with their employment and salary histories as input. Following her company's best practices, she will split her data set into training, validation, and test, will implement some data pre-processing, will interpolate missing values, filling in the blanks, guessing the blank values. And after that, she will perform model selection, tuning, and validation, and look at the results. So when Anne considers the accuracy of the trained model, she will observe a disparity, and that is accuracy of prediction is lower for female job applicants. And this presents a kind of a fairness issue. Considering the complexity of this data science pipeline, Anne probably has a long night of debugging ahead of her. Next slide. Thankfully, Anne has a hunch. She goes back to the data pre-processing step and observes that the value of the attribute age is missing far more frequently for women than for men. Then she looks at her data interpolation at the method she used to guess fill in missing values. She compares age distributions by gender and she does notice a disparity starting from the mid-30s. Mid Anne revisits the data cleaning step and selects a state-of-the-art data imputation method to fill in the age in customer demographics. This example illustrates a more general issue, and that is incorrect or incomplete choices during data modeling or data preparation can introduce systematic distortions in the data, affecting performance of predictive analytics downstream. Other examples include systematically guessing a person's age or gender incorrectly because these values are missing more frequently for some demographic groups than for others. And importantly, it has been documented that data quality issues, such as missing or dirty data at the input, disproportionately affect members of historically disadvantaged groups. And we risk compounding technical bias due to data representation with pre-existing bias that comes in for such groups. Next slide. We developed a bunch of tools, including ML Inspect, a lightweight data distribution debugger for data pre-processing pipelines, next, and FairPrep, a system that supports data scientists in their day-to-day -day battles with technical bias by enabling sound experimentation. And I don't have time to discuss this here, but I'm giving pointers to the papers where we describe them and to the open source code. Outcome equity is next. Uh, in the next couple of minutes, just I know I'm out of time, uh, I would like to address this final and perhaps most difficult dimension of equity. It's concerned with whether and how we can assess and mitigate inequities that arise outside the system's direct control. Next. And this thinking is very timely because all over the world we are looking at ways to regulate the use of automated decision systems, including automated hiring tools. And Serge will speak about this uh, in quite a bit more depth after me. Uh, I would like to just flag here that in New York City, where I live, we're currently looking at ways to oversee the use of automated hiring tools in particular with the help of auditing for bias and public disclosure, explaining to job applicants why they were selected, what characteristics were not selected, a tool picked up when it evaluated their candidacy. Next slide. Uh, one of the helpful metaphors here uh, that I really like for public disclosure is a nutritional label that is comprehensible, short, simple, and clear. It's consultative. It provides actionable information for a job applicant. For example, what tests they should take to improve their chances of being selected for a job. Nutritional labels should also be comparable across vendors, implying a standard and because they are produced as a result of long, complex, difficult data science pipelines, they need to be computable automatically. Next slide. As part of uh, supporting outcome equity, I'm also passionate about educating technical students about responsible data science. Here I'm showing a course, uh, one of several courses that I have developed and have been uh, teaching uh, at New York University. And this course I'm showcasing is in its third year, and it has been able to attract an amazingly diverse and engaged group of students. All course materials are publicly available online. Please take a look and please use them. Next, 
I will also note that we have been developing a data responsibly comic book series. Its first volume has been translated into Spanish and notably into French by Serge Abedbul. Uh, and the second volume was just released last week. So please take a look. Next. Uh, I also think that we all should be engaging in public education, in explaining to our partners, parents, children, what technology can and cannot do for us. Taking away, kind of taking out this magical thinking about technology, including AI. Uh, we are developing a public education course in collaboration with the Queen's Public Library in New York City called We Are AI. It will be broadly released in April. And again, I'm looking forward to, to folks looking at the course and giving us feedback. Next, uh, there's also a bunch of policy and public engagement activities that I won't go into. Uh, next, just 30 seconds for takeaways. Next slide. Um, so one thing that I would like to say is that it is clear to me that we technologists have an important role to play in the responsible design, development and use of data science tools. An important thread that runs through our discussion is that we cannot fully automate responsibility. While some of the duties of carrying out the task of, say, legal compliance can in principle be assigned to an algorithm, the accountability for the decisions made by these systems always rests with the person. And this person may be a decision maker or a regulator, a business leader or a software developer, or importantly, a member of the public. For this reason, I see the role of technologists such as myself in helping build systems that expose the knobs of responsibility to people. Next. And of course, the systems that we're helping build are not simply technical. They are socio-legal technical. And in some sense, technology is the easiest part. This means that to expose the knobs of responsibility to people, we must work together to create meaningful regulatory mechanisms, a topic on which I touched very briefly and that I hope Serge will speak about in more depth. Um, to make progress, we need to step outside our engineering comfort zone and start reasoning in terms of values and beliefs, in addition to checking results against known ground truths and optimizing for efficiency objectives. This seems high risk, but one of the upsides is being able to explain to our children what we do and why it matters. Next and last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. You can see the courses and the comics at the link here and the wonderful graphics are due to Fala Arif Khan. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for this uh, presentation. Do we have any questions uh, from the participants? I don't see any question in the discussion area, but uh, if uh, someone want to directly ask a question, please. No question? Yes, Laurent, you can ask directly uh, your question to, to Julia. Uh, thank you. I wonder how much uh, uh, how the risk you mentioned about uh, decision made by uh, machine learning systems would also apply to decision made by human experts. My intuition being that uh, it probably would be the same with human experts, with the difference that probably uh, uh, the level of transparency uh, with human experts is uh, frequently quite low. And the, yeah. the brain cavity being the, the worst of black boxes. This is a great question, right? And there, of course, you know, we, we could spend half an hour uh, going back and forth on, on our debate on this. But ultimately, I agree with you that, of course, uh, the reason that machines are making decisions that are biased is that the data that reflects human decision making is biased. And also the conditions and the kinds of questions that we're asking these machines to answer themselves embed the biases of human decision makers. Uh, ultimately, though, if a decision is made in error, it's incorrect or it's racist or it's otherwise unacceptable to us. If that decision was made by a human, we can hold that human accountable. And also the number of decisions that a particular human can make is limited, right? So there's only so many people that a particular hiring manager can hire or not hire. 
But with machines, not only are they opaque, right? There's also no actual responsibility that we can assign to a machine. You cannot fire a machine, you cannot put it in jail. Uh, and the decisions that are being made with their help are on an extremely large scale. They affect thousands, tens of thousands of people at once. And so that's why the urgency is so much greater here. A way to look at this positively, though, is that the fact that machines are now in the mix, that these decisions are being made either by machines alone or by an interaction between a machine and a human, are allowing us to engage in introspection, to look at our own decisions, at human decisions, and be sure that we're explicitly saying what standards we're holding ourselves towards, and to use machines to help us oversee, to keep our own decisions in check. So this boundary right now between an algorithmic decision and a human-based one, I think has been blurred very much, right? Because it's not really just the, these autonomous decisions that we're interrogating here. There's always a human there somewhere. Um, and ultimately, yes, we should be keep, keeping ourselves to a higher standard. Thank you very much for this answer. Thank you, uh, Julia. A last question. We will have an other question during the, the debate, but uh, from Diego, what if we take away from the training set any sensitive features such as age, gender? We know that is uh, an approach uh, done in hiring right. system, for instance. What do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, this unfortunately is going to be insufficient. This is known as fairness through blindness. And if we look at uh, the political philosophy context, this method of simply removing age or gender or disability status from a data set amounts to a formal equality of opportunity approach. It says everybody comes to a competition with all they have, right? Whatever qualifications they have acquired over a lifetime, let's say. And when they compete, we only look at the relevant characteristics. So this method actually is something that came out of the uh, French Revolution where the goal was to make it so that not only aristocrats can compete, that being from the aristocratic class does not automatically give you opportunity uh, to have access to a job. But as you can already see by this conversation, right, simply masking these features is not, not going to make up for a history of a lack of opportunity that a particular individual or an entire population group has been experiencing. So if I have not received adequate training, let's say, or if I don't have money to even, you know, go hire a tutor to do well, well on a test, simply hiding my gender or my race will not go very far. That being said, there are some competitions where a formal equality of opportunity method, such as removing gender or race, is appropriate. And that is when we have no reason to believe that, in fact, there were results of historical disadvantage, and we just need to mask some of these features that would bias a decision maker. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for all these uh, answers. I think that we could debate a longer time. Uh, now I'm going to, um, uh, we, we're going to upload the presentation of Serge, Jean-Marie, if you uh, can upload the presentation and uh, Serge, the floor is, is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Christine. So we're going to speak about. I'm going to speak about uh, content moderation in social media, and uh, I think you you'll see some of the the issues that uh, Stefan and uh, and Julia have raised uh, in in a practical context. Next uh, slide. So that's the organization. Next slide. Uh, and that's the title. Next slide. I should have made less of that. So. Let's let's open first the hood a little bit to see what uh, what uh, these social medias are all about. And there are, there are many different aspects if you if you see some of them. But uh, focusing on the most important ones uh, from the point of view of the business model, pricing and auctions are probably the most important. From the point of view of uh, this presentation, the two that are most uh, uh, important are recommendation and moderation, and we're going to, to come to them. Uh, but uh, from a practical viewpoint, uh, all this is, is just a database. It's a database of content, and uh, you have ways to access them. But basically, the, the problem is going to be uh, which content are you be going to be exposed to? That's recommendation. And what content 
uh, shouldn't you be allowed to push to this database? And that's moderation. Next slide. Uh, deep in the, the fuel of the entire thing is personal data. So we are exactly in GDPR, but uh, that's not really the topic uh, today. We will encounter here and there issues with GDPR and moderation, but that's not really the, the main uh, thrust. Next slide. Recommendation algorithm. So, so we're getting we're getting there, and uh, the idea is uh, in your social media, you you have uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, contents that have been published. Probably many that are published by people that are interested by the same thing as you. And the question is that you're not going to look at uh, a million or even a hundred thousand or even a thousand content. You're going to look at some okay maybe even if you spend hours on uh, on facebook uh, insta or whatever you're not going to look at at millions of, of content so so basically you the recommendation algorithm is critical because the, the algorithms is going to decide what is going to be presented to you and basically if the recommendation algorithm is not presenting a particular content to you from your point of view it's as if it's not existing so this is this is very interesting because uh, this thing that has an extreme importance for you because it's going to make the difference between I see it and I don't see it. This thing is totally secret and uh, you don't know what it is. Uh, it comes from a very large number of factors, of course. Uh, the, something that happened very recently is going to be promoted. Something that happens in your close circle is going to be promoted, but there are many, many other things. And uh, it's actually defining uh, the social media that you're using. The, the algorithm is not the same in uh, YouTube and in, uh, in uh, Facebook, okay? So, so that's going to be critical for defining what you see. And uh, even worse, in, to a certain uh, point of view, it changes dynamically. So it's not, it's not even that, oh, I understand what's going on. I understand what they're showing me this. Tomorrow morning, that may change, and uh, the world is going to look different for you. So this is a major cause of biases, because basically uh, it's not like you have a, a database where you have data and you go and look. It's uh, some algorithm that's deciding what you can see and what you cannot see, and it's biasing the world for you. And uh, uh, you know, people talk about the, the, the bubble, bubble, information bubble. What's information bubble? The information bubble says that the algorithm is going to present to you uh, things that you are closer to, things that uh, that you like typically. Uh, so, so, you know, is it good? Is it bad? I'm not even putting any, giving any value judgment there. It's just the, the, the reality. The reality is that it's, it's getting it's showing to you things that you are, you know, more likely to like. Uh, now, that's not very new. I mean, when uh, I was subscribing to Liberation in, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was choosing a newspaper. Somebody else was uh, subscribing to Le Figaro or to uh, Le Monde or uh, whatever. So basically, you, you're choosing already your information. But in a way, this was some active choice. Uh, the algorithms are choosing for you. Uh, something else also that you may have heard is that uh, Twitter, for instance, is uh, promoting more or giving more uh, uh, visibility to extreme uh, messages. Typically, why? Because these are the messages that are going to engage people more, and that's what uh, what they want. Next, uh, next uh, slide. So the other thing that was for uh, uh, for uh, the the choice of what to show to you now the other one is content moderation and content moderation what is it what it is it's uh, the process by which the, the the social media is controlling content and is going to control content essentially to push away some content that's unwelcome and and it's very important to see exactly what's unwelcome. First of all, it can be unwelcome because it's illegal. Okay, uh, you know, you are not allowed to put uh, uh, racist uh, to publish racist content in France. So the social media in France will have to uh, block such contents. Second thing is uh, 
content that the social media decides is inappropriate. So, for instance, the social media very often uh, from the United States where nudity is considered as inappropriate and nudity is going to be blocked uh, in, in many social media. It's not appropriate in, in all culture, but this culture of a particular social media is, well, it's inappropriate. Next uh, slide. So I'd like to spend some time uh, discussing the difficulty of, uh, of content moderation and, and the first uh, three difficulties I'm going to take from uh, data science, from big data, uh, it's the three V's. So you're all familiar with content. Uh, we know the billions of content every day that that's not very easy to moderate all that. Uh, the variety, <coughs> the very different uh, kinds of, uh, of uh, things that you'd like to, to block. Velocity is something that that is uh, also a difficulty that's perhaps less uh, visible. It was very very clear for Christchurch, where uh, you know you have to decide that this video of terrorists attacked at Christchurch, again two mosques, was something that you don't want to promote, and the social media has to decide that almost instantaneously. And actually, in the first couple of minutes, it started going out, and then when it's out, it's it's even more difficult to to stop. Next slide. Uh, so it's not easy <coughs> uh, because of the language. Human language and humans are, are not very easy to catch. I mean, they, they use jargon, slang codes uh, in, uh, in France, and that different from countries to countries. Uh, if they want to, uh, to do some racism against Muslims, they're going to use the word Islamist, uh, sign is for Jews, and so on. There are uh, lots of ways that uh, essentially beats the machine. So I'm going to give you an example that uh, when I visited with uh, some uh, uh, a French group of, uh, of uh, people, we visited uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, I, I should go back to this actually, for, to the origin of this. At some point, the French President Macron, Macron uh, met with uh, Zuckerberg of Facebook and they, they basically chatted and, uh, and, and Macron said, well, this cannot continue like that. Uh, you know, your, your systems are, are really uh, uh, hurting society. And, and Zuckerberg says, well, we don't want to hurt society. Uh, help us find a solution. I'll open my company to a group of people from the French government and uh, you know, everything will be open to them. They can ask all the questions and then maybe uh, they can uh, help us find, find a solution. So I was part of the group, and the day we one day we went to Barcelona to, to the moderation center of uh, Facebook, and they're very happy to to show us this uh, this last content that they detected as a hate speech uh, that was racist. Uh, Comment faire l'amour avec un nègre sans se fatiguer? I, I won't translate in 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 English because this in English it, it sounds even worse than in French, and. Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, next uh, next slides. And unfortunately, uh, this is a book. The book has been translated to English. It's the book is by Dani Laferriere, who is black, who is actually a strong anti-racist uh, militant. And if you know the book, if you know the context, this is definitely not a racist attitude. It's the opposite. So, so that's really to to show the the difficulty. And very often moderation is complicated by the fact that you don't have the context and you don't have the context for sometimes good reasons like GDPR. Uh, the moderators should not have access to all your secrets, so they're not given context. But as a result, they are shown like a piece of content and they say, well, in isolation, is this, uh, is this uh, hate speech or not? Is this fake news or not difficult? Next slide. Uh, moderation is not even easy for human. You must have read some of these articles and, and actually you imagine very easily even before reading the article that sitting in front of a computer and being through all the garbage of the web uh, for eight hours a day, uh, of course, it's, it's going to be difficult. Next slide. So uh, it's very difficult for, for, uh, for humans. So let's ask machines to help us or, or do it for us. And, uh, and typically the, the, the idea is very, uh, I'm not going to describe it in detail, but you can understand you get lots of uh, contents. 
uh, with annotations, you train them, and then you get uh, uh, an algorithm that will, a machine learning algorithm that will help you say this is good, this is, this is okay, this is HP, this is uh, fake news. So how does it work? Uh, how good does it work? Uh, so it's reasonably efficient now for terrorism and pedopornography. It's harder for hate speech. It's even harder for fake news. Uh, obviously, it's much easier for text than for images. Now, the status today is that uh, algorithms are already detecting more undesired, undesired content than humans. It was particularly true during uh, the COVID crisis because uh, humans could not get to the moderation centers of, of these big companies. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and we are getting used to that, but, but basically not too much of advertisement for it, but the detection now is, is really heavily based, is made by machine. Uh, there is a, a caveat though, which is, uh, they really insist that there is human confirmation. So the machine has detected some uh, some content uh, that's, you know, content is classified as hate speech. Before it's blocked, a uh, human being says, okay, block it. Now, uh, you have to understand a bit the difficulty because this human being gets a, a flow of, uh, of content that supposedly the machine believes is uh, is to be blocked and if the machine is very good uh, the human is going to say yes 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 and it's going to be very bored and and at the end the decision of the human has absolutely no, no value uh, now we're not there yet because the algorithms are not that good uh, they're not that good but from a private source uh, from what i understand they are already believed to be better for humans uh, uh, but better than uh, than uh, humans for each speech text. So, you know, very specific, but still. And I really believe that because a couple of people told me that, but uh, absolutely no proof and, and nobody uh, can prove it as far as I know. Next slide. Uh, so, why is it not easy? And that has been said actually by the previous uh, speakers, human have biases, okay? So if you look at notifications by humans, they are super low quality. That's that's very clear. Which is, you have these systems now, and you can say, well, you look at a, you, you look at a, a content, and you say, well, this content is really not acceptable. Uh, the guy is saying that the uh, uh, OM soccer team stinks. That's a speech. Well, I'm sorry, it's not a speech. It's because your reaction tells you because you love. The, the soccer team, your reaction says, well, this got to be hate speech. No, it's not hate speech. So notification by humans are super low quality. Moderation by humans is better, but it's not very great. Um, although these people are trained. They, they are not lawyers or specialists, but they are, you know, um, normal average human beings who have a training for a couple of months before they become moderators. And their the quality their quality is not that great either. Now, uh, the moderation by the software is not as bad. I didn't say it's good. It's not yet good, but it's not as bad as the moderation by human. Just because it's difficult. Uh, now there are serious issues. Uh, I, I put two, but there are many more. One, it's uh, extremely difficult to have measures. There is no benchmark, as far as I know. Uh, there is no co cooperation or collaboration on this topic. Uh, researchers who want to work on the topic have lots of difficulties getting data. Uh, small companies don't have the, the means to uh, build the corpus that's necessary for this. So it's, it's really a, a, an area where lots of things can be uh, improved. And, uh, the, the difficulty also is uh, it's just difficult uh, to detect if it's biased. Okay, um, first of all, how do you define biased? As, as I started, there are lots of biases in these systems. What bias do you want to measure? Next slide. Uh, so, when you want to define bias, you have to go back to the definition of inappropriate for social media. Uh, so, as I said, it varies from country to country, it varies from platform to platform, so what are you going to, to capture? 
Okay, so you know, if I if I I push to the extreme, I'll say, well, is inappropriate whatever my system decides in, is inappropriate, and then in that case, I have zero bias because basically whatever I decide is inappropriate is by definition correct. Uh, so how how is it done? Let's let's go a little bit, just a little bit uh, deeper in the, in the process. First of all, you have some kind of meta level. Uh, the meta level, you are one of these platforms and you define the rules. You define some ontologies, what are the protected uh, uh, users, uh, what, uh, what are the kind of uh, messages I want to, to uh, reject, hate speech, blah, blah, blah. And I want to define rules. And you see, these rules are, are, are complex because you have to say, well, uh, this verb is in this category and, and that's bad, okay? But uh, if it's talking about these particular categories of users, then it's even worse. And if it's in this particular category of users, it's not as bad. So you see, it's, these are, these are uh, rules that talk about concepts that are not very easy to specify. So that's already a difficulty. You, you can think of that as uh, applied ethics. And, and if you want, uh, you, there are books in, uh, in, uh, in some of these companies, they have books of such rules, because basically the rules have to, to adapt to all kinds of messages that can come out. Now that's at the meta level. And then you have the data level, and the data level, you have uh, large amounts of content with annotations and uh, data that you're going to use that to train. I think I have to, to speed up a little bit, so next slide. Uh, what can be done next? Uh, I'm going to go very fast to the things that do not do not work. Uh, there was uh, this uh, dream for a long time that uh, social media will self-regulate. Um, you, know, you open the newspapers to see that it's not working. Actually, it's not working because they don't have the legitimacy. And uh, I, I, I'll be as far as saying, even if they were perfect, uh, even if they were perfect, which they are not, of course, even if they were perfect, how would you qualify that? If uh, uh, they block a content, people will say, well, they should not have blocked it. And if they don't block a content, some people will say, oh, they should have blocked it. So people will never be happy and, and, and that's, that's, uh, they are bound to, to fail. Then there can be a regulation directly by states and, and we don't want that. I personally don't want that. Next, uh, next uh, slide. So this is uh, uh, the regulation that seems to be uh, uh, a possibility, one, one direction to go. Uh, that's, uh, you know, as I mentioned to you, this group of uh, people from the French government, we wrote a report and that's what we proposed. Uh, similar kind of things now is, uh, seems to be uh, coming out with the uh, Digital Service Act. Uh, so what I'm going to describe here is is very general. So it's it's uh, it's in the spirit of this general discussion. Uh, the super social media is supervised by a regulator. The social media and the regulator specify the goals together. Uh, so it's goal oriented. Uh, then there is a full transparency that's very important. Uh, in particular, you can measure, which is something that's really bad now. It's totally impossible to to know what's going on as moderation in these platforms. I have absolutely no idea what's going on in YouTube. Even in Facebook, I've spent months uh, and I've been to Facebook a very large number of times. They open their books, they explain their algorithms. Still, I cannot tell you exactly what's going on. Uh, regulation ap applies only to the big guys, what's called now the, the fashion is to call them structuring platform. Uh, sometimes they, they are called gate gatekeepers in the uh, Brussels terminology. And uh, that's not too much in the Digital Service Act, but that's something I strongly believe there should be a participation of society to define the moderation levels and mechanism. It cannot just be a, a discussion between the state and, and, the, uh, and the, the platform. Next. Uh, we could talk about also trying to change the business model some you know I don't have time to talk about that but some of the causes of the problems are the, the business model and there are different ways to go for it like peer-to-peer -peer networking mastodon some of you may know or moderation by the peers like WT social next and uh, of course in the long uh, run uh, strongly believe that the, the solution is by 
uh, addressing the problem of the users. Because, you know, if there is a fake, fake, uh, a fake news, the fake news is not born from, uh, you know, extraterrestrial uh, uh, origin. It has not been written by the software. The, the fake news comes from a human being. And, uh, and, and that's what you have to address. So you have to uh, essentially educate people, learn how to, how to analyze, uh, teach them how to analyze, teach them how to, to, to think before writing something. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's not a good, it's, it's, not a, it's not a perfect analogy, but just to, 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 just to provide one, uh, now, if you, when cars were invented, okay, uh, cars were invented, and it was like a, a total mess, and uh, every, the roads were becoming uh, really dangerous. And then people said, well, you know, we have to, to educate the drivers, and we have to ask them uh, to have a driver's license, and, uh, and, you know, we have to make that a bit organized. Uh, maybe that's the same thing for, for the social media. Now, these are too complicated bits. We have to educate people perhaps ask them to, to get a driver's license for, for running on the social media. Uh, and there, there, there is this idea that's, uh, that you find in WT Social, which is uh, you have to ask the people to themselves do the, the moderation. Actually, Twitter now is, is talking about uh, introducing things like that, where, whereby you would be part of the moderation. You're part of the problem, so be part of the solution. And uh, dialogue with Evil, I don't have to talk about time to talk about that. Next uh, slide. Oops. I, okay. So that's, that was actually the end. Uh, and uh, I, I give in the side the, the pointer to the, the report and uh, an article that I wrote with a friend. And uh, this is a, a course where uh, on, on AI ethics, uh, where uh, Julia invited me to to give uh, to 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 participate. There is a course also for for the French people. There is a course of uh, PSL PSL University uh, that uh, in the that in the machine learning course of uh, of uh, PSL there is a module on uh, machine on uh, AI and ethics. If you're interested, thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Serge, for your presentation. So, do we have any questions uh, uh, from the participants? Uh, for first, the, the Serge, just the Serge presentation. So, Serge, for your information, we have um, work on going on uh, moderation. We have a postdoctoral student who, who is a participant and uh, it's uh, Valentin Crosset. I don't know if, uh, Valentin, you have a question um, on moderation. No question in the chat? Okay, so uh, we have uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, left. So uh, what I propose to you is to uh, interact and debate between uh, three of you on different subjects. So uh, I know that we, we can discuss about a lot of subjects in, the, in, the, in your different presentation because we had a very technical uh, uh, solution given by uh, Stéphane, then uh, uh, Julia saying that, uh, well, okay, technical solution is not enough, <laughs> we must uh, go further. And uh, Serge, uh, who addressed the issue of uh, of regulation. Uh, so I'm going to, to ask you a first question, but for the participants, if you want to ask question, it's still open in the chat. I have a question uh, first for probably for, for Stefan, but also for the, uh, the three of you concerning the, um, the, the fair ML uh, and uh, um, uh, saying that uh, in general, we address one uh, variable uh, for fairness, so gender, race, and we know that it is uh, limited, how we can address fairness with uh, multidimensional uh, variables. So if you have, uh, and, and what is the limit of this uh, fairness with a lot of variables included in, uh, in this concept? So Stefan, uh, I don't see you in... Uh, okay, Stephen, yes, Stephen, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, of course, uh, in general, to make mathematics, you just uh, stipulate that you have one uh, one sensitive variable and you split your population into uh, into segments. But if you have many variables and many constraints, 
then uh, it's pretty sure that you completely, uh, in my experience at least, you completely deteriorate uh, the predictive performance. The more you add constraints, you have no guarantee that uh, uh, the algorithm, as they are now, uh, given the, the current state of the technology, uh, that will still perform uh, well. But uh, if you have sparse constraints, uh, as I shown, uh, maybe it, it, can, uh, it can, can still work. This is a, a, a certain way of um, including uh, fairness uh, issues in your algorithm to, to, to specify constraints. But as, that is a, as it has been said already, uh, you could uh, consider using only certain types of variables or using uh, variables that are independent from some uh, sensitive uh, variables. Uh, it's, uh, it's an option. Uh, and here I have discussed um, uh, fairness from the perspective of statistical learning, but you could try to modify some uh, predictive rules uh, so as to achieve fairness uh, objectives. It's another uh, approach. I have no time to, to discuss that, but uh, it's a possibility. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stéphane. Uh, may I, uh, sorry, may I respond yes, Julia, to this as well? Uh, yeah, so I just pasted a couple of links to papers that my uh, student and uh, colleagues and I recently wrote that specifically address this question of intersectional discrimination. And this is what we're referring to here, right? So intersectional discrimination, the idea is that by belonging to multiple historically disadvantaged group groups, for example, by being a black woman, your opportunities are limited in ways that are more than additive, worse than additive. So it's much, much harder for you to get a job. And unfortunately, current anti-discrimination laws in the US and more broadly don't specifically target intersectional discrimination. So an employer, for example, could be hiring all white women and all black men, and they would be satisfying their constraints on non-discrimination on gender and on race. And so this is problematic. Uh, and one simple way to interpret the requirement for intersectional discrimination is really to look at uh, performance, for example, at your fairness or at your error rates for all intersections of the various categories. But that is actually not going to do because you do want to simultaneously not discriminate against women and not discriminate against racial minorities and also not discriminate against black women. So it is a difficult uh, constraint optimization problem, no matter where you look. But ultimately, I think where our thinking fails and where a purely mathematical and purely technical approach fails is that we, on the one hand, say that we believe the data, meaning we want to uphold utility that Stefan uh, referred to. And on the other hand, we don't believe the data because we think that it embeds discrimination. So we need to be very honest with ourselves to become comfortable with losing this utility that is based on biased data in favor of actually leveling the playing field. And what combinations of attributes you consider is also not arbitrary, right? We are not uh, required to admit to, for example, hire enough women with blue hair who live in tall brick buildings. That's not a meaningful category. But we know what categories have been discriminated against and we should absolutely be targeting them. And so for those of you who are interested in more technical details, once again, I pasted some links to some work, uh, the latest one includes a causal approach, actually, to intersectional fairness that I'm quite excited about. Thank you very much. So we have a question from Jean-Marie. Do you want uh, directly to ask your question, Jean-Marie? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you for uh, for the, this presentation, which was very, very interesting. Uh, I have a question for Stefan. Um, if we do not have access to sensitive variables such as gender or, or sex, is there any way to construct a posteriori the sensitive variable using, for example, Latin representation of the algorithm uh, and to devise the algorithm afterwards? means that uh, a posteriori you have access to this uh, information, no, otherwise you cannot connect uh, uh, the latent variables to, uh, to this, uh, this sensitive variable. Uh, but actually, uh, 
you're right. As, as I said, uh, Serge, it's very difficult to assess bias or unfairness uh, in particular because you, you have your data and uh, and how, how do you know if it's uh, really uh, unfair? Uh, as I said, there, there is, fortunately, in the case of facial recognition system, there is this uh, NIST uh, website. And of course, uh, it doesn't give you uh, clues to... Um, correct your uh, your system, but you can evaluate it at least. Of course, you don't know the population on, on which it is uh, applied, uh, but uh, you can uh, you can uh, see the possible uh, disparities in the, in the uh, in the performance. And so, in general, it's very complicated to uh, to, to evaluate uh, degree of. And by the way, it's you are not supposed to reconstruct uh, sensitive variables. They are hidden because you should not uh, look use them. You should not look at it. So reconstructing them is uh, is just uh, illegal. <laughs> Sorry, and I have a response again to this, and that that actually is, is slightly more complex than this. It depends for what. So yeah. I just pasted the link to a U.S. centric uh, point of view on this, and this is for the purpose of banking for deciding who should get a credit card. At the decision point, you should not be looking at a person's uh, membership in protected groups, but still banks are liable to report population level performance with respect to their lending practices. So to make a decision in the US at least, the doctrine of disparate treatment, and this is what Serge is also referring to, is preventing us from using these characteristics and we should not be reconstructing them. But for the purpose of reporting overall, you are allowed to, to reconstruct. And the way that you do that usually is by bringing in additional data sets. So for example, if you have demographic information about particular areas in the US, that would be the census. You can take a join of the data set you have and use some external data to extrapolate. But always it's within a context of use. Should you or should you not be reconstructing? And if so, what method is appropriate? Do you agree, Serge, with this? No, no, absolutely. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's. Uh, I, I totally agree, of course. And I'd like just to step back a little bit for a number of uh, of issues in this context. Defining fairness is a difficult. Not uh, enforcing them or checking them. Just defining it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not very clear. Defining what you want as fairness is already a political agenda. Sometimes in some Indeed. applications. And also defining what's performance, what's accuracy is a political agenda. Yeah. For whom are uh, you accurate? Yes. Uh, so in, in uh, uh, to follow this idea, I have a question because it's very interesting for, uh, for, for us. Uh, in the chair, we have in interdisciplinary works and um, you are all of you, three of you in computer science and uh, we see now the trend of computer science uh, saying what is fairness, fair, the, the fair uh, ML uh, trend and uh, um, also uh, people in computer science looking at, uh, at uh, uh, other disciplines and on the other side we have also the, the trend of sociologists and people in social science uh, uh, working of course on uh, artificial intelligence and, and the problem uh, of artificial intelligence and ethics of, uh, of AI. And my question is how we can, uh, how is it possible really, really to work together between the disciplines to address the issue? And um, is it an interesting uh, thing to do? <laughs> Finally, because we, we know it's an old problem, it's an old question, but uh, on, on the topic of uh, responsible technologies, how, how we can do that? So uh, I, it's a so easy question that I take it. <laughs> so it's, it's not a question of whether it's possible or not. The question is it's not possible to do without. I mean, the, 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 you, you just have problems that you're not going to solve only with technical issues or technical uh, capabilities and it's not going to, you're not going to be able to solve them if you don't have these technical possibilities so basically you need both so the i think it's a very easy question either you uh, collaborate and bring together all these people or you just uh, forget about the problem and decide that we're never going to do uh, uh, ethical ai <laughs> 
Julia, you agree. Have it's, uh, it's necessary, but uh, it's not that easy uh, to uh, to exchange ideas, especially because of the algorithm is very formal and uh, you have to, uh, to go into uh, details. But uh, at Telecom, at least, we have recently recruited a lawyer, Winston Maxwell, and he knows about uh, the legal aspects, the constraints, what is possible, what kind of variables we can use, especially in uh, in the banking domain, because he's an expert on, uh, of this uh, of this field, and uh, we work also with uh, final users. I think uh, to uh, it, this is true as well for um, explainable AI. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you are interested in the deployment of these solutions, you have to uh, discuss with the end users and uh, to, to communicate. But it's not easy, and I think uh, in practice from your academic career uh, perspective, it's never, uh, uh, it's never very efficient. Mm. Julia, is it the same uh, thing in the United States? Or? I think it's the same thing everywhere, but I mean, I, I also want to say that easy and efficient is never the goal uh, in life or in scientific research, at least that's, that's my uh, my point of view and I think it's a lot more fun to be talking with different people and uh, when what I started with is to say that this topic responsible data science is where I don't have to think about myself separately as a person and as a computer scientist and I think that if you take that point of view and this is something that I learned from Serge also through many years of knowing him is that when you don't separate the kind of intellectual and the human side of yourself your life becomes much richer and it becomes much easier for you to be speaking with people across a broad range of interests and expertise. And it's just so much more fun. And this also is having a side effect of bringing in people into computing who typically are not well represented in computing, who are not white men, right? I mean, we see a much more diverse group of people here uh, and a much more diverse set of skills appreciated exactly because we absolutely must work with others. Um. Thank you, Julia. Uh, and uh, perhaps because uh, uh, we it's uh, six uh, thirty. Uh, just a, a last question to to probably search, but to to all of you. Um, you know that in the in the Digital Services Act, you have this idea of transparency of algorithm, um, which is also in the high level expert group uh, from the European Commission. Um, how to do that with uh, platforms uh, such as Facebook, Google, Twitter, you know this, uh, this uh, issue. So uh, you presented the, all the problems uh, to understand how these algorithms work and if we don't understand really how it works, it's difficult to solve the problem of moderation and to solve the, the, and to know how they also uh, detect with algorithms uh, fake news and uh, and uh, all the negative content. So, um, do you think it is possible or not? Oh, of course, of course. You uh, actually, yeah, I would say exactly like the previous answers. It's easy. If it's, <laughs> no, I'm, it's not easy. easy. I didn't say it was easy the previous time. <laughs> I totally agree with Stefan. It's complicated. Uh, it's not easy, uh, and the, and and the and the companies, the platforms are going to do their best to avoid it. But uh, I don't think that there is a choice. If we don't know what they do, they have they are they have an importance in in our society. They are in importance in defining in shaping our society that's so big that they cannot continue working in an obscure manner. Now, uh, once you said that, how do you do it is, is a good question. So, so first of all, you, you, you may require information from them, like you do for the telecom industry. I'm, I'm working at RCEP. We are used to ask the telecom to give us uh, data. So for instance, uh, they, sh you know, they, should, they should provide data such as uh, how many content uh, they, they uh, decided was hate speech, uh, how many contents was fake news and so on, and how they blocked, you know, they, they could give this kind of information. And that's, I think, is, is the first level of, of transparency. Another level of transparency is what are the algorithms that they use for pushing, uh, for pushing uh, content? Because basically that's defining their, the, 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 the world today. Uh, I think there, there is a second level, and, and that, that I think is, is uh, 
is just regulation. The governments or the, the European, uh, the Euro Europe has to decide that they should provide this information. There is another dimension that I think is uh, part of transparency is how this is defined. How, the, how do they define the goals? And that I think is something that they cannot do just by themselves. Uh, deciding what the, the content they accept and they don't accept should be decided with society. And that's going to be difficult because uh, who? I mean, uh, lawyers, uh, associations, uh, the states. So that's something to invent. But, but basically, I think it's in, in a way it's beyond transparency, it's participation to the, the definition of, of moderation. Uh, so I'm going just to to take the last question from Valentin because I think it's a very good question for all of you, for all, all of you, uh, our three speakers. Uh, do you think that the algorithm is a new form of editor? So we know the status of editor. So which status should be given to uh, them in order to ensure a responsible regulation and control of this source? So is an algorithm a new form of editor? Serge, do you want to? I, I can answer. I can answer that because this is uh, this is really the, the one of the uh, cornerstone of, of uh, the need for regulation. Uh, the the uh, the platforms for a very long time have tried to tell us that they are not editors. They are just giving you access to content, but they did edit the content. They didn't touch it and so on. Uh, I think this was fiction. This has been fiction from the beginning, but it was the law. I mean, this was the law in the US, it was the law in Europe. They are not responsible for the data they do. They are not editors. Now this, this fiction has disappeared uh, when uh, the CEO of uh, Twitter uh, decides to, to remove the account of uh, the, uh, uh, how do you say that, the ex-president of the United States. I'll be polite, okay? When he decides, <laughs> he decides to do that, it shows that it's doing some editing work, but that's a platform. And uh, whether they use algorithms to do that or not, I, 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 you know, it's of course it's important, but that's not the, 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 the critical part. The critical part is the platform is an editor in this case. It uses algorithm to do this editing, but the, the, the responsibility is a platform. Uh, so I wouldn't say the algorithm, of course, the algorithm is doing some editing work by blocking uh, a particular piece of content, but the responsibility, the, the real editor is the, the platform. So Julia and uh, Stefan, do you want to say something about this uh, question? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'll say very quickly that absolutely, of course, I agree with Serge and also I want to say that who oversees the editor is important. And so we do need regulatory uh, controls in place. And it's also important for us to understand that how we come up with regulation also cannot be entirely top down, right? We actually need input from members of the public. And so it's very, very hard work for us to explain to people what is going on and to give them a voice in this conversation. But it absolutely must be done. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so I think that it's time to end this uh, webinar. I would like to thank a lot again uh, our three speakers, to thank a lot uh, all the participants and to announce to all of you that our next webinar will take place in April the 8th and we will speak about hiring uh, systems. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much uh, and um, uh, for all of you and I hope that uh, you will be you will attend and so our uh, next seminar. So thank you. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for having us. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye-bye.